Good afternoon. Welcome to Erisat Network. Friend, as you know, in the last two lectures, we discussed fiscal policy and economic stability. And for the well-being of people and prosperity of nation, we need economic growth. So what is the relation between fiscal policy and economic growth? We'll try to understand in two lectures. And economic growth is more important when a country faces economic crisis. As you have heard that, uh, a few years back in 2008, America faced an economic slowdown, and we can say economic crisis. What were the steps taken and what was the impact on other countries? So we'll try to understand in big, big, big picture and we'll try to understand the economic situation and status in India in respect to the world. So uh, we'll try to get a true picture and what uh, steps need to be taken to come up from the present situation. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio eminent economist Dr. A.C. Sarma. He is professor of economics and has written two books and contributed an uh, article in National and International Journal. So, on your behalf, I welcome Dr. Sarma for EduSet lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Shall we go to Yes. For today's discussion, I would like to make a starting point from the 2008 financial crisis, which by now every one of you are familiar with, that this crisis, the so-called financial crisis, it started from the United States of America. From there, it spread out to the European Union countries. And the result was that both American as well as the European economies, they entered into a recessionary situation. Now, it was almost uh, six years back. Enough efforts have been made both by the American policymakers as well as by the European policymakers. But even today, what we find, we find that European economies, most of the economies are still reeling under recession. In the case of the United States of American economy, what we find there is a slight hint of picking up growth. That is the situation. Now, if you try to understand that what was the response of the Americans, of the Europeans to overcome this crisis, you will find that both in America as well as in Europe, since it was a financial crisis, so this crisis was thought to be overcome by bailing out that is the monetary incentives, expenditures. This was the one side of the response. The other side of the response was, particularly in America, the rate of interest has been at 2% per annum for a number of years. And as per the American policy makers, they do not want to change it anymore. They want to retain it as long as they can. But if you, if, you, if you see that even after six years of keeping the rate of interest at such a low level, the American economy has not been able to pick up. The investment climate is not picking up. Now, what are the reasons people, even today, are grappling with this problem? Now, if you have a look at the Indian economy, then you will find that Indian economy initially was just not affected by the financial crisis which took place in America and then triggered to spread out to the European Union country. It did not. But to prevent that kind of situation, 
government of india through its finance minister they took a conscious decision to provide a fiscal stimulus so that the growth rate which this country had achieved by then does not slip away that is the response which the indian government did that they went in for stimulating the economy through fiscal deficits or what we call the fiscal stimulants now this went on for 1 2 years and as the the the, the lecture which was given to you yesterday they he must have told you that once you have that kind of situation the government boring ultimately goes where the ult- government boring ultimately leads to inflation government boring if they are not uh, if they if, if they they ultimately lead to boring to the uh, uh, and uh, this boring leads to inflation and inflation means that it leads to higher and nominal rate of interest now if that happens then it affects the capital formation and once it the capital formation is affected it affects the growth also now if you if you if you look into the indian scenario then you will find that today india is reeling under the rate of growth which is just about half of what it was in the year 2010 so fiscal stimulant stimulus was helpful in raising the level of economic growth which continued to be in the neighborhood of 9 to 9.5 percent for few years and this is what exactly keynes theory also propagates that in the short term the theory of output and employment tells you that in the short run there would be a spurt in growth but that spurt in growth in the long run cannot be sustained in the long run it degenerates into what we call it leads to the efficiency losses in taxation and it also displaces capital that is it affects the capital formation and investment and as a result the growth rate comes down now also <clears throat> at this point of time i would like to share with you another thing that this fiscal deficit if it if it if it is prolonging over a period of time then it keeps on adding to the debt situation of the government fiscal deficit of this year when you move on to the second year if you if, if this fiscal deficit is not uh, paid for then it will keep on adding 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 and this keeps on piling up the debt what we call the government debt so fiscal deficit it also translates into capital account sorry current account deficit and this both they, these taken together they lead to accumulation of debts and it is the accumulation of debts which at the end of the day in the long run affects both the as i told you earlier in the that it affects both the efficiency of taxation and also it displaces capital and the result is that it affects the growth now what we what i want to do i want to explore this debt addiction how long it can continue and if there is any 
possibility of overcoming this debt problem because it is this debt which ultimately degenerates into if it becomes unsustainable it degenerates into crisis it could be a macroeconomic crisis of any variety it could be a microeconomic crisis of balance of payment difficulties it could be a macroeconomic crisis of uh, what we call the currency crisis and it could also lead to the banking crisis now if the country concerned is not in a position to make or it finds difficult to make payments abroad for the commodities goods and services which they have brought which they have bought from them if they are not unable to if they are unable to then it keeps on adding to foreign debt and foreign debt means that it has to be paid for now if foreign debt starts becoming unsustainable it leads to crisis it is at this point of time that if you are not in a position to borrow it from anywhere then you have to fall back on the international monetary fund resources to and international monetary fund comes to the rescue of the governments so that it is one kind of macroeconomic crisis the other kind of macroeconomic crisis in which a country can run into if debts are unsustainable they are the currency crisis now it will depend on the total debt of a government consists of two parts one is the internal debt the other is the foreign debt now if the proportion of foreign debt to the total debt is high or is unsustainable this can lead to what we call the currency crisis a crisis which in the 1997 in the late 90s occurred in the east asian countries now the third type of crisis which can occur in an economic system is the crisis which is what we call banking crisis now banking crisis means that bank it amounts to the failure of the banks it amounts to the failure of the banks that banks are not in a position to 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 they are not in a position because the banking system operates your deposits now these deposits the, the money belongs to you this money has been lent out to others and uh, when they see the you are paid interest the bank charges interest from there this is how the banking system operates now if the lending of the banking system is reckless that is the loans which are advanced they are not returning back and then if you at on any given day go to the bank to withdraw your money and if the bank does not have the money then there would be a a panic there would be a panic and a herd mentality would, would would emerge on the scene people will start rushing to the bank bank is not in a position to so this is what we call the banking crisis so either you could run into banking crisis or you could run into the uh, what we call the, the currency crisis or you could run into the balance of payment crisis debt has a very very important role to play in the economies of the world now for today's <coughs> lecture what i will do i will deal with the concept of budget through which fiscal policy is implemented and then proceed to examine the trends in fiscal and current account deficit which through accumulation of public debt as i told you that it produces or it leads to efficiency losses in taxation 
as well as it leads to capital displacement. This is what we will try to do, try to have a look at today. And uh, tomorrow, we will look into the 2013-14 Indian budget to explore or to see how the 2013-14 budget has responded to the kind of situation which we will try to explore or examine today. Now, budget in a, in a, in a, in a very simple language, budget tells you nothing. Budget is a budget are used by the government. Budgets are used by the government to plan and control the fiscal affairs of a nation. To plan and control the fiscal affairs of the nation. Now, if this is budget, then what is fiscal policy? Now, fiscal policy tells you how taxes, which provides you with the revenues, and public expenditure, they are set in the budget to, now they are set in the budget taxes and the public expenditure and they tell you how to dampen the swings of the business cycle. That is what the fiscal policy, that whenever you want to increase business activity or whenever you want to reduce economic uh, business activity, depending upon what is happening in the economic system, you make use of the fiscal tools. You can make use of the taxation. You can make use of the... And this is, this is what you have already learned in the form of what we call expenditure multipliers of the Keynesian variety, the tax multipliers which you were taught in the in your lessons in macroeconomics. <clears throat> so budgets, uh, the fiscal policy helps you in dampening the swings in the business cycle and it also contributes in the maintenance of a maintenance of high employment growing economy from high and volatile inflation. So fiscal policy plays its role in providing you a tool through which you can dampen the business cycle, the swings in the business cycle, that is the ups and downs this is one part of the, uh, this is one major uh, uh, sort of contribution which the fiscal policy will make to the system. The other is this will also contribute to the maintenance that the a growing economy is maintained at high employment situation without being affected by a high or volatile in inflation which leads to volatility in the system. Now, with this understanding of budgets and fiscal policy, I will just give you an overview of how this fiscal and monetary policy has been used in the developed countries, what are the assumptions on which they were designed for the developed countries, and how these assumptions are different from in the underdeveloped countries, including India, that will give you an idea that why whole hog we cannot make use of fiscal and monetary policies in the form in which the developed economies are putting it into. Now, if you go back to the history, it is almost by now 75 years 
as many as 75 years have gone by when in 1936 lord keynes came up with his theory or a theory of output and employment now at that point of time keynes was struggling with the world wide depre depression in which the economies had entered into in the 1930s now he succeeded in overcoming that but uh, his theory was taken by the world economists as a whole at that point of time as if the problems of the economies have been taken care of by this theory and we do not have to suffer any more whenever we suffer any economic crisis the theory is already available the 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 the, the policy uh, parameters which can be drawn from these theoretical structures as soon as you implement them you would be in a position to overcome that but that has not happened even today <coughs> most of the economies are suffering from low unemployment uh, low unemployment they are also suffering from rising productivity and incomes they have a problem they have a problem of inflation they have a problem of good jobs almost all the problems which one can think of they are available and the gravity of these problems if you look again historically you will find that from the 70s onward these problems are coming up again and again again and again again and again in one form or the other in one country or the other country according to one economist from 1970 till about 2003 4 or maybe 2008 as many as 107 107 economic crises have developed in various parts of the world now it is a different matter that these are all associated with the unregulated market economies all market economies all economies which are working on a free laissez faire economic system without any and they are tied to the international monetary fund this is a question which is debatable but for the the for the for today's purpose it should be more than enough for us to keep in mind that economic crises are not new they are coming up often often on in one form or the other in one form or the other and it is also a fact that uh, generally it has been now agreed that fiscal policy which came up in 1936 as a savior to the world economic system it is now generally agreed that it works only in theory and not in practice people are of the opinion economists are of the opinion that it is the monetary policy which is preferable to overcome the problem of unemployment and inflation so fiscal policy all by itself cannot give you provide you any handle to overcome economic crisis okay <clears throat> now the last two lectures which uh, you were exposed to they dealt with quite comprehensively with the underlying theoretical structure 
and the debate between the Keynesians and the monetarists to deal with the issues uh, arising out of economic instability. I will not go into that. I will. I have only. I have only given you a overview. But what I will do now, I will concentrate on the theoretical, the assumptions of this theoretical apparatus, and try to show that the in the underdeveloped world, or in the developing world, or the or in particular in the Indian case. The all assumptions on which these theories were constructed or drawn up upon, the those assumptions were no longer available in this part of the world because the the Keynesian and monetarist debate or these theories they were derived in under conditions of Full employment. That is, conditions under which the market economies, without any regulation, they are working. So these theoretical uh, structures, they were all right as far as those countries were concerned. Now, what was the situation, let us say, in underdeveloped countries or in India? All underdeveloped countries, they were looking for. Developmental economics: How to grow, how to develop. So instability was not a problem for them. It is because of the difference in assumptions. These countries did not have a situation of full employment because in 1930 the economies of the world. They deviated from the full employment. That was a crisis, business cycle. In these countries, it was not the business cycle. It was never a business cycle. We were growing in the pre-independence period only at one percent. Our rate of growth was one percent in the pre-independence period. We had a problem of savings. We had a problem of unemployment, but unemployment of a different kind. Our unemployment was, in fact, underemployment, disguised unemployment. So we were looking for a different kind of theoretical structure, or our problem was altogether different. It is here that you come across Regor Nuxes. Thesis, which dealt with the problem of a pool of vast unemployed, underemployed labor force, unskilled, that you use them in public works through public investment, which then will create demand. And initiate the process of development through the Keynesian expenditure multiplier. So, in underdeveloped countries, or say in India, the role of fiscal policy, the Keynesian fiscal framework, came into being in this form. in the developed part of the world the problem was different they had underutilized capacities we did not have the underutilized capacity we had to create capacity and if you are familiar with the development strategy <coughs> which india adopted you will agree that we adopted a strategy a strategy which was based on The development of capital-intensive industry first. That was our strategy, and that strategy we, which we wanted to develop that that we were to develop through the mechanism of 
planned investment. So, as far as this country is concerned, we certainly used the fiscal policy in the form of tax cum subsidy incentives to enhance, to increase development. But the use of fiscal policy was in combination with other instruments which we drew from the planning process. That was the licensing system, regulation. So, we had a very combination of a mixed kind of instruments which we adopted to achieve our objectives. Of course, fiscal policy in this form was one of them. So, the whole idea which I am trying to convey is that under these conditions, the assumptions of the that theoretical structure were not operative here. Our problem was altogether a different problem. If you look into the overall economic policy of this country, then fiscal policy is one of the instruments which we had used to achieve growth. <clears throat> if you look into the 60s and 70s, or particularly the, 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 the first part of the 60s, that is the third five-year plan, we had made use of an expansionary fiscal policy to achieve a higher growth rate. From 1950 to 65, the growth rate which we achieved was 4.1 percent. Compare this growth with the pre-independence growth, which was hardly 1 percent. From 65, if you move further till, let us say, 1980, 81, the growth rate shifted from 4.1 to 3.2. It was a slight decline. Now, there is a reason for that. I will not like to go into that. I will only concentrate on to make you understand that fiscal policy continued to be a part of the overall economic policy framework which this country had adopted to achieve growth rates. Similarly, if you move from 81 to 88, the growth rate then again shifted from 4.1 to 4 point, sorry, 3.2 from shifted from 3.2 to 4.8. And if you expand this time horizon of 81 to 91, then you will find that your growth rate was about 5.1 percent. Now, if you move again from 91 onwards and look at the period from 1988 to 2006, the growth rate average per annum would be about 6.2 percent. And from, if you move from then onwards, when this fiscal stimulus was given in 2008-9, the rate of growth almost approached 10 percent. It is only after attaining that 10 percent rate of growth, we are again coming back to, we have come back to the 5 percent rate of growth as far as of today. Now, how did we achieve this growth rate? Was it only through fiscal policy? Certainly not. In our case, domestic savings have played 
a very, very important role. So, it is a combination of our domestic savings, our expansionary fiscal policy and our foreign borrowing. These three have combined together to produce this kind of growth. So, this growth rate cannot be assigned only to the fiscal policy. Fiscal policy has worked in combination to achieve this growth rate. If you look into the data, look into the data and data on fiscal deficit, you will find that uh, between 71 to 75 the, from the available data I am saying, from the available data the, the, the earliest I can go back is to 71, 75, the fiscal deficit was 5.5 percent. So, it amounts to expansionary fiscal policy. Similarly, if you look into the period between 76 to 80, fiscal deficit rose to almost some 8 percent. So, fiscal policy that is the fiscal deficit has certainly the expansionary policy has certainly played a role, but to say that only through fiscal policy one can achieve this rate of growth is not true. We have to use fiscal policy in combination with monetary policy, with foreign borrowing, with domestic saving. Because in the in the in the, the uh, in one of the last two uh, lectures, you must have been told how the saving investment identity works. The private savings are always equal to private savings plus government savings plus foreign savings. Now, what is this government savings? Government savings is either budgetary surplus or budgetary deficit. If it is surplus, then it will add to the private savings. If it is deficit, it will subtract from there. Now, a fiscal deficit gets translated into current account deficit because foreign borrowing, your foreign saving. Now, what is this foreign savings? If you have a surplus or if you have a deficit in the current account, if you have a deficit in the current account, then that has to be matched by foreign borrowing or foreign investment. So, these three taken together, they are equal to the private investment. So, what I was trying to tell, tell you is that, that fiscal deficit gets translated into current account deficit, only then it matches with the, it is a different matter that these both deficits, if they continue in a prolonged fashion, then they keep on adding to the public debt to which I will come later. But right now my idea is to tell you what was happening on fiscal deficit front and as the current account deficit front which was leading to the public debt. Seventies I have told you, if you look into the later part of seventies, then a substantial amount of foreign debt, foreign borrowing you will find there also. If you move on to the eighties, Now, during the 80s, 
we had both large fiscal and current account deficits. In the 80s, we had both large fiscal as well as current account deficits. While the fiscal deficit oscillated between 8 to 10 percent, it oscillated between 8 to 10 percent. You can imagine if the fiscal deficit is oscillating between 8 to 10 percent, what is the level of the expansionary fiscal policy? We were only pumping in money. And if you look into the current account deficit, then you will find that even the current account deficit, particularly in the second half of the 80s, was quite large. By 1991, the current account deficit had, of, had gone to some more than 3 percent. Now, which is unsustainable, particularly in a situation. 3.1 percent current account deficit of GDP is unsustainable for the very simple reason that this is a period in which your stated policy was import substitution policy and not trade liberalization. So, if you are importing, if you are only importing, now imports are to be paid for. How do you pay, pay for? You pay for only by selling your products in which you have a comparative, comparative advantage. Now, if you are, if you are refusing to use that comparative advantage to trade and on, on, on trade front you are imposing tariffs, then obviously you will run into this kind of situation and this is what precisely happened in, the, in 1991, that we ran into a very serious foreign payment crisis on balance of payment. We did not have money. We did not have any stock. We did not have any accumulated reserves. So, during the 80s, both fiscal and current account deficits were quite, quite large. But what happens after 91? After 91, you see, you had devaluate your currency and you had liberalized your trade. So, if you look into the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s, you will discover that India was insulated from the deficits on current account insulated in the sense that the current the level of current account deficits was not very large or was not such that it was unsustainable. If you look into the situation of public debt that is the fiscal debt uh, the uh, fiscal deficit and current account deficit when they keep on adding to the debt together, then you will find that when while in the early 80s, our debt was just about 40 percent of our GDP, only 40 percent of our GDP. In this full one decade, it almost doubled to and reached some 82 to 85 percent. This is one. The other important which you need 
the other important point which you need to remember in the in the context of debt is the composition of the debt this 82.4 or 83.4 or 85 point of gdp debt in 1991 was equally distributed among internal debt as well as the external debt so one can understand the magnitude if you have that kind of external debt then that external debt has to be paid for now how do you pay for short term borrowing long term borrowing or some other source that was the time if you can remember or if some if, if someone has told you you were suffering from the credibility gap problem no one was willing to lend you that was the kind of situation in which you have had ran into so what do you do then 91 crisis was a very major crisis and that was the crisis of payment crisis so if you continue to look into the status salient features of the fiscal and current account deficit after the crisis of 91 92 then you will find that the debt to gdp ratio declined during the first several years of the 90s it declined but again towards the end the trend reversed the debt to the other salient feature was the debt to gdp ratio that rose especially rapidly starting 2001-2 and it crossed 90% by 2003-2004 but the 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 saving grace was that this 90% was distributed among internal and external debt in the ratio of if 75% was internal debt 15% was external debt and since 2003 4 the government debt has been in the neighborhood of some 80% now the point is now i just want to draw certain conclusions what do we learn out of this data and the additional informations which are available to us so the one salient feature of the indian economy on which everyone agrees is that that india since the 1950s had a very stable macro economic environment one two now it certainly does not mean that india did not have its share of crises we certainly had crises we had a crises but these crises were short lived they were quickly corrected and all these crises except one they were because of the balance of payment difficulties now why it was why is a is a question which needs another one lecture but the one must remember that india had its share of macroeconomic crisis but they were very mild they were corrected correctly and they were largely on account of balance of payment difficulties 57 58 foreign exchange crisis 65 67 crisis leading to devaluation 
devaluation of our rupee in 1969, 80, 81 crisis leading to the loan from the International Monetary Fund and 91 is a known where, where we were even forced to, forced to sell our gold. It was only in the mid 70s that we had one another type of crisis that was the crisis of stagnating output with the rising inflation. But that was because of the oil crisis, oil problem, oil prices. That was the kind of problem in which we, we had. Uh, <clears throat> now, from 91 onward, the situation has dramatically changed and we are now approaching the theoretical assumptions on which the developed economies are functioning. We are moving towards that. We have not as yet attained that status because the structural reforms which are needed to make India as a totally market economy, we, the, the political system is not accepting that. There is a problem. We are not in a position to move in that direction. So we are in that sense safe. This is one. The other safety which we had, although we had this crisis, every, everything is there. The other safety net which we had is that we are insulated from the international capital market vagaries, which means that we are nowhere near the currency crisis. We are also nowhere near the banking crisis, which I told you in the beginning. But look at the way in which today our economy is settled with. We have a problem of inflation. We have a problem of current account deficit. We have a problem of fiscal deficit. We have a problem of the investment is not, investment climate is not there. We have almost all the problems with which the developed part of the world is suffering. And our rate of growth has come down to 5%. Now, in this context, it is very, very important for us that we cannot keep sitting idle. We cannot be complacent. We have to find ways because we have to remember all the time that from 91 till date, our growth was largely on account of liberalized regime. That is, our regime in which our trade was, our exports were growing leaps and bounds. Today, we cannot export. We, number one, we cannot produce. Number two, the developed countries, they do not have incomes. What do we do? Shall I continue? Or? Yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah. We oh, have five shall minutes. Shall come to close? No, we have five minutes. You have five minutes. So, uh, with this understanding, I am only posing a question now and I am leaving this answer for you people to think over, if you can think, tomorrow what we will do, we will take up the 2013-14 text. Uh, budget budget or uh, the fiscal policy to see how government of india has responded to or is responding to or is planning to respond to the emerging situation of declining growth rate day by day day by day day by day so this we have to this will take up tomorrow. In the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, I'll give you only one more information. Okay, sorry to interrupt, we have questions. Huh? Sorry to interrupt, we have a question. Oh, okay.
question from Mumbai. Yes, uh, good afternoon, friend. Please ask your question. Yeah, so my question is, what is the difference between fiscal deficit and current account deficit? Uh, pardon, central? Uh, fiscal deficit and current account deficit. Okay. What is the question? question is, what is the difference between fiscal deficit and current account deficit? You see, fiscal deficit arises out of the domestic expenditures which are taken by the government. Now, if, if you look into the fiscal policy or if you look into the budget, budget has two components or two parts. One is the revenue part, other is the expenditure part. Now, the difference between revenue and expenditure will generate the fiscal deficit. If there is, if revenue uh, or if the revenue and expenditure are equal, then you have a balanced budget. If revenue is more, expenditure is less, then you have a surplus budget. But in case revenue is less, expenditure is more, you have, okay. Now this is the fiscal deficit. Come to the current account deficit. Now, current account deficit is on the external front, is on the external front, is on the external front in the sense that you are exporting and you are importing, you are an open economy, you are an open economy. The exports and imports of goods and services, if the difference between this is large, equal, or less. This will generate the current account. So it is on the foreign front, that is on the domestic front. Domestic front, okay. Okay, we have um, uh, one more I have one more question, like as you were telling that um, uh, India is also facing a problem after the, the world faced the economic slowdown or uh, uh, we can say the crisis. Hmm. So, what is the major problem as you suggested that uh, on uh, not on the banking side, not on the um, uh, finance side, but on the side of um, uh, uh, inflation and uh, price rise? You see, so, uh, so the, 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 you see the problem to my mind. Okay. And I, as it has been a 13th Finance Commission uh -huh. report you see the, no, so the, even the 13th Finance Commission has addressed the problem of public debt. Okay. And they have, you see the public debt creates problems if its composition is such. Okay. Now, internal problem, in, internal, de, internal debt never creates a problem because it is your, it is your own loan which has been distributed among the public. So that, that never creates a problem. The problem only arises if your foreign debt is more. Okay. That creates problem because that has to be paid for. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't keep on lingering on. Mm -hmm. So Finance Commission, when it looked into the composition of the debt, public debt, mm -hmm. they discovered that the proportion of foreign debt is so small okay. that it cannot lead to any crisis in the international capital market, that is, it cannot lead to the currency crisis. Okay. Now, as far as the, you see the, I am also grappling with this problem, mm -hmm. I leave it to you also, you also grapple with, mm -hmm. I have also told the audience also that if they can find some solution, but the problem is there and problem is, because it is, unless the global economy picks up, mm -hmm. till such time, we will have problem because our growth from 91 onwards, mm -hmm. if you look into the composition of this growth, that is trade the event. contributing factor, then trade, trade is the major or the second one is the service sector. Okay. Now, this service sector is sustaining mm -hmm. on softwares. Okay, we will discuss all these issues, okay. how can we contain the price rise and other, uh, other economic uh, uh, problems so in 
tomorrow lectures so and today i hope uh, you have got the major point which we want to communicate to you so with this word we conclude the lecture i thank all of you for watching the lecture and on our behalf i thank dr ac sharma for giving such a insightful lecture thank you very much thank you